So welcome to the state of platform maturity in the Norwegian public sector. <laughs> oh, what's well, so great to see all of you. Uh, I was here last night and thought to myself, this is a big room. <laughs> I hope we get to fill it up. Um, you, you guys did it, so really, really great. So a little bit about me, I like to talk about myself. Uh, this is actually not that long ago, we are hiking with my kids and my family. Uh, so that's one of two things, it's uh, outdoor, being outdoor with my family and then technology, that's really my passion. So when I'm not uh, outside, uh, I'm a developer, um, working with a, a, a developer experience at this company or organization called NAV, and I'll get more into what NAV is, where I'm focusing, I'm the observability tech lead. And then also very, very advocate of uh, open source technology in general. So this uh, talk here today, um, the uh, title might have said a lot, so maybe you know, at least you know the gist of it. I'll dig in a little bit about Norway, Norway 101. <laughs> no, there are no polar bears in the street, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> talking a little bit about how the road, the path to cloud native for Nor the Norwegian government have been, and talking about the, the survey we did, and sort of that's the, the maturity and the state of maturity in the Norwegian public sector, and then also some interviews we did uh, as well. So, um, this is, keep this in mind, uh, sort of, for the duration of the talk. Um, in, in, in the Nordic countries, we have this Nordic welfare model, um, and very, very focused on, a, on a, a strong and large government that sort of provides all the uh, sort of security network that you need uh, in order to be a citizen of the countries. So that means very focused on social welfare, high, high, taxa high taxation in order to do income dis distribution, um, focus on labor flexibility, workers' rights, gender equality, and also free education. And of course, free education, that means, doesn't mean it's free. You know, someone has to pay for it, and, and that's what the government do. So more specifically about NAV. Um, so we have the tax agency, that's the other really large agency in, in Norway. They take all the money in. We basically hand it all out, all out again. So we actually, uh, have one third of the Norwegian annual state budget, uh, not through IT, unfortunately, but to give out everything from parental benefits, sickness benefits, uh, pensions, etc. All the social welfare that you need is going through uh, NAV. <clears throat> and some uh, stats about NAV that I managed to dig up. We still have a code from the 1970 running in production. That's without revealing too much, that's almost twice my age. Um, we have 20,000 employees, so which makes us the largest government agency in Norway, um, and roughly 800 developers. And that includes consultants, and that's the number of seats we have in our GitHub organization. So that's the best count I can get for how many developers there are. And also in GitHub, we have 2,000 public repositories, because we really, really believe not only that we should use open source and open standards, but we should contribute back and we should be as open. This is already paid for by the public and the code that we write should also be open. And so if you want to create <laughs> your own welfare administration, go ahead, G get cloning. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So for this story to make sense, we need to uh, rewind seven years ago. This was uh, KubeCon Europe in Berlin, and I believe sort of this is the keynote. It's almost the size of the room we are on today, so which tells us a little bit about how this conference has grown. Um, at this point, Kubernetes was only two years old, um, and very few people had heard about Kubernetes at all. But by act of chance, the uh, welfare administration and the tax administration was there. They didn't know one another at that point. They didn't know that they were there. And again, by chance of accident, they met in a coffee queue. And like, I know you're from somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I'm from Norway. Yeah, me too. Oh, you're interested in Kubernetes as well. Yes, we are, in fact. And actually, the guy on the right, Odin Strand, is sort of the, the, the mentor for when in my organization, in the welfare administration. He is uh, so, sort of uh, the mastermind behind uh, what I'm going to tell about, or this part of the story at least. Um, 
and I met up uh, and went back home with a lot of great buzz, as uh, one does after uh, being part of KubeCon. And they, to get, together with the tax administration, they created um, Offently Pass, or what would, would be translated as Public Pass Norway. Um, keep in mind, this was pre the platform engineering uh, sort of uh, definition. It would probably have had some, something about platform engineering if we were creating it today. But this was, general, this was the, uh, the starting of everyone in the Norwegian public sector that cared about platforms. And first it started with Kubernetes and then it's grown to so much more as we see now with uh, cloud native, um, the cl whole cloud native space. And we have uh, regular meetups. Um, we gathered a uh, lot of people uh, last year. This is not only from the public sector, but these were the Norwegian delegates that I managed to get hold of when we were in Amsterdam. And generally, sort of a really, really nice space to collaborate and has a lot to do uh, with what I'm going to talk more about uh, where we are today. But this was, again, this started seven years ago. And today, this community has uh, this is from our Slack community, the Slack workspace. It's 1,400 mem individual members across about 50 different public um, organization, or organizations or administrations. But we are getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, so this is how the Norwegian public sector and enterprise organizations looked like uh, before platforms. And this is probably very familiar to those of you working in large organization that's been around for more than 10 years, We've been around before Kubernetes, then it looks something like this. And this is, again, what we are trying to <laughs> still get ourselves a little bit out of, the, of, of these technology decisions because they are quite expensive and they lock us into some sp specific vendors. And then, um, the, actually, the, the parliament has for a number of years actually passed sort of um, strategies. And these were, uh, the first one was from um, 20, uh, 2012. Um, and that was based on a very similar strategy from the European Parliament called the Digital Agenda for Europe. So this is the Digital Agenda for Norway. And then so a couple of years later, they revised it and had a new one under the same name. And the last one now is sort of one public sector and they sort of have graduated and seeing that this is so important, digital technology is so important for the public sector, and we need to be more uh, unified and having a cohesive user experience. A very ambitious goal, but uh, it sort of says something about the, the, even from the political standpoint. And these things here, they sort of created a shift in principles from sort of very walled garden locked in into more of an ecosystem and they also shifted from relying primarily on proprietary tools and standards and vendors into more open standards and open source. And also went a little bit away with a very, very strict focus on hierarchy into more autonomy. And we see that reflects in, in more and more organizations in the public sector in Norway. And we also see sort of a personal uh, a change in personal preference. So this is a, um, a company called Universum um, that does sort of uh, surveys each year for students and professionals when it comes to their sort of working habits or work preferences. And sort of from 2021, uh, friendly environment, competitive base salary, var variety of assignment, respect for people, and, and sort of career development was sort of for a long time, these things didn't really change. And more recently, we have seen sort of a shift in focus here sort of flexible working conditions and also secure employment with sort of the, the economic downturns. And these things actually play quite well for um, the public sector. And this was the most attractive IT employees in Norway for 2023. And we can actually see a n number of, of public sectors here on the list, which means sort of like they must be doing something right. Um, we just don't know what <laughs> yet. Um, which brings us to the survey. Um, so the survey uh, consisted of um, 31 questions, uh, ranging from general questions about platform engineering, question about Kubernetes, and also adoption of 
public cloud, and it was primarily distrib distributed through our Slack workspace, the Offently Pass public pass workspace, as well as LinkedIn. So we do know that there exists some sampling bias here. Um, these that have answered the, question, answered the survey are primarily the ones that are quite positive and sort of are actually working with platform engineering and sort of have already adopted that. Um, so we need to keep that a little bit in mind, in mind when sort of um, disambiguating the, the results here. Um, but before we sort of jump further, for, forward, let's sort of dig a little bit in just so we are on the same space. Um, what is really a platform? Um, so this is actually from the tag app delivery um, that has a very, 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 very good um, white paper on platform engineering from the CNCF working group. <clears throat> so there are, it's, it's a very long uh, paper, so I've tried to condense it to, <laughs> to the highlights. What's, what's a platform? And it's this focus on developer experience. It's this taking in um, feedback from the developers and asking the right questions. What, how can we make development more pleasant for you and your team? And some of these practices involve focus on onboarding and documentation, so removing sort of the painful task of actually being productive as well as sort of understanding what can I do and what's, what is the method of doing the right thing and doing the things that I want to do. And providing self-service mechanisms um, and not, be, not ticketing and not waiting for other people to actually open that firewall or provision that virtual machine or you name it. Um, but rather being able to actually do the, do the job um, either via code or some self-service portal or what, what, what not. And they also mentioned sort of the being optional and being composable as important trait of what the platform is. Uh, so nowhere does it say that it has to be containers, it has to be Kubernetes. It doesn't, those things are sort of implementation details and underneath there, and they might be underneath there, but it's not sort of what, what makes a platform. But it's very important this last, time, last part here, that it's being in most as, <laughs> as, as uh, optional as it, as it can be and as uh, sort of composable, where you can mix and match what type of capabilities are you actually needing from the platform? You don't need to embrace it all in order to make use of it. And then a little bit after sort of the, the definitions of what's a platform, and this was actually, I believe, announced last KubeCon, they actually created a, a platform, engineer, platform engineering maturity model, which tries to sort of answer the question, how, how, platform, how, how mature is your platform or how mature is your platform engineering? principles, and you have four aspects, sort of investments, how are staff and fund allocated to platform cap capabilities, and then there's various degrees of sort of how mature you are, and I'm not going to through all of the maturity stages, but investment, how are funds, staff and fund allocated, adoption, why and how do users discover and use internal platforms, interfaces is how do users interact with and consume platform capabilities? How do the developers actually interface with the platform? Operations being how are platforms and their capabilities planned, prioritized, and developed and maintained? Not sort of operations as in application operations, but more like the whole life cycle of the platform as a project, product. And then lastly, measurements. Sort of what's the process of gathering and incorporating feedback and learning? So this is the sort of the areas that we asked the organizations in order to grade themselves. So it's a self-grading um, maturity um, uh, survey. So um, a little bit breakdown of the respondents. So we had 20, 21 agencies and I'm not going to go, go through all the budget and, and the employees stuff. And we had 12, um, uh, 12 uh, state-owned enterprises, that's the -E, SOE, which sort of uh, some more private-like organizations are owned by the government and act as government agencies, uh, more or less. There's category one and two, the one being sort of uh, 
very private and very competitive in, 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 in a competitive market, and two being sort of, this is a very special area uh, that sort of, for some reason, we have chosen to, to incorporate it as a, as a corporation, but it has some special laws and regulation, and it's also funded by the government in, in a large degree. We have included the category two in the results. And then we got one municipality and one university. Those have been sort of excluded from the rest of the results since that doesn't really give us a good picture uh, when it comes to municipalities and universities. But all in all, sort of when we account for the number of agencies, um, their uh, total employee, employees, and as well as sort of budget allocated, it's roughly one third. So one third of the Norwegian government sort of answered this survey, and we believe that's, that's a fair amount, and it sort of paints a picture, at least, the ones that are interested in platform engineering. So the first question was, um, do you have a platform? And if yes, what's it called? And here are all the names that we got. So that's, that's really cool. That sort of paints a picture that this is not only treated as a, as a project, it's actually treated as a, its own internal product and with its brand and, and sort of hype around it. Uh, and you can see that 82% of the respondents said, yes, we do have a platform, and then 18% um, did not have, and they are not passed on further. And then we asked about the motiva motivation. So why, if you're building a platform, why are you building a platform? And almost everyone said that this was to increase developer agility, the time it takes for developers to actually get stuff done. And get, when they are ma making some brilliant application on their local machine, how long time does it take before it's running in production and available to the end users? And then we see a declining in the sorting on, on sort of how um, how many responded what, sort of quality being very, very high there, and sort of, uh, sort of a notion to that having a long and tedious process doesn't really ensure high quality, rather the opposite might be uh, actually true. Recruiting, another important uh, part here, that this is the, the organization needs to be relevant to its employees. And then resource optimization, security, and then lower, very much lower, is sort of cost optimization, uh, because um, most of them probably running on premise and sort of like it's not necessarily uh, a cost optimization effort in order to um, make a platform in that regard. And then sort of digging a little bit more into what is the capabilities of these platforms here, and of course, not surprisingly, everyone offers sort of build, deploy, run, and sort of you can't really make an application platform without having that. So that's a little bit given. Then we see observability being almost 100%. You cannot build, you cannot run and operate an application if you don't have any tools and any insights. So I'm a little bit curious what the remaining percent there is <laughs> sort of deploying something in, in complete darkness without knowing what, what happens. And then source control management also being a part of the platform um, capabilities and platform engineering team. And then we see sort of security functions, having persistence, databases, storage, etc., and then network as sort of a, a feature or capability of the platform. And again, that makes sense, given that most of these here have a huge on-premise footprint, where there are dedicated team that does all of the networking, dedicated team that does all of the databases and storage, etc. <clears throat> and then trying to sort of see how many applications, uh, or how many application teams, rather, and what programming language to get a little bit more sort of feeling for what are these platforms here. And we can see that it varies, but the sort of the, the majority, or the highest, uh, either it's, it's rather small, or it has sort of between 11 and 50 application teams. And then we have some, um, some organizations that have 100 plus. Um, but, of course, very few of those. And then on the, on the programming language side, not surprisingly, Java and Kotlin doing very, very <laughs> strongly in, in Norway, and then JavaScript and TypeScript, and then .NET being a smaller share, and then Python, and then 
Go being the last one. And I imagine that, that those were sort of the platform engineers <laughs> that answered, yeah, I write Go, and I deploy my application to the platform. So a little bit about um, infrastructure. Um, and this is, we can see it, it's a slightly higher percent that uses Kubernetes than that uses cloud. And again, sort of being, uh, coming from sort of a very, very heavy on-premise, um, uh, on-premise heavy organizations and a little bit risk aware and, compli and compliance heavy, it's not um, that uh, unreasonable to think that many of them are uh, running Kubernetes on-premise and without using cloud. But we also see that public cloud is using in being used and adopted in more and more degree. And we see that again with uh, sort of how many years have you been running in production. So seven years, that was sort of uh, the KubeCon um, where uh, tax and uh, uh, welfare met. And then we can see sort of like it one year went uh, where they evangelized and, and told everyone about sort of, oh, this Kubernetes thing. And then we see a, a huge spike in adoption in Norway. So that's quite, quite cool. Uh, we might at least hypothesis uh, that that is the reason behind. Of course, the Kubernetes becoming more and more mainstream at that point is, is also con a contributing factor. And we see sort of number of years running in production with cloud is a little bit lower, and very, very few. Uh, that's been running it for seven years. It's mo mostly six years or, or uh, below that. So then that's sort of the question here, sort of few or many. <laughs> are, are they running few Kubernetes clusters, or are they running a lot of Kubernetes clusters? What, um, raise your hand if you think that uh, most of them run a very few amount of uh, Kubernetes cluster. And, and who, know, who would think that uh, they run a lot of Kubernetes cluster? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, none of you are correct. It's, it's actually split in the middle. <laughs> so if we define at least few as one to five clusters, and then many as being six plus, uh, it's actually straight down the line there, um, which is Again, uh, from talking with a lot of these, um, these uh, organizations, that again my impression as well, that some, at least uh, about half are running very few amount and then more multi-tenancy and more namespaces in the clusters. And then you have someone that's re running, running a ridiculously amount of Kubernetes cluster, like 100 plus. And I see some nods and uh, you can probably ask some of them afterwards. <laughs> and then you also, also asked about sort of technology adoption, and not surprisingly, sort of the most mature CNCF pro projects are the most adopted by these companies here. So again, sort of looking at sort of what's the graduated or, or um, stable project in the, within the CNCF ecosystem influences sort of the, the, um, the uh, technology adoptions. So then brings us to sort of the, the main part here, the platform maturity. So um, remember, sort of we have investment, we have adoption, we have interfaces, we have operations, and we have measurements. So on investment, we actually see that uh, it, it's, it's very mature, in, in my opinion. Uh, so you, at least very, very few have sort of like um, voluntarily or temporary platform team. Again, these are answered, yes, we have a platform. Um, and the sort of the optimizing is sort of, yes, we, not only do we have a product, but we have sort of an enabled ecosystem where we have contribu uh, contributions back from the application teams. Again, adoption, we see that a little bit more, um, um, more, uh, I'm just scrolling here, a little bit more um, uh, mature here when it comes to, it's not only sort of a, someone outside that's sort of like, oh, you need to run your applications on this platform. It's more and more sort of a pull from inside that the, it's fear of FOMO, fear of missing out. Developers are, oh, there are so many other applications running on this platform and, and so many other application teams that have used this. We must use it too. And we can see, we, I see that in my own organization that if you, you're on the risk of losing out if you're not part, if you're not uh, de deploying your application to the, one of these platforms. And then interfaces, sort of how do users interact? It varies from sort of very custom processes 
all the way to self-service and integrated solutions. Again, it's not, um, here we probably see a little bit more of uh, infrastructure as code and not that mature when it comes to self-service portals. So these numbers here resonates in my mind as well. But still we see a um, lot of organizations uh, uh, have not only standardized tooling but also self-service solutions. And then the fourth here, operations, sort of how do the um, platform teams actually work? Um, and some of them, of course, are sort of by request. There is a ticketing system, not surprisingly, but more and more sort of like we have our own backlog. We do our own priorita pr prioritization and sort of uh, del del all the way to sort of uh, delivering managed services to our end users. And where we see sort of the least maturity in all of these here is when it comes to uh, measurements. Again, not, this is not surprisingly, uh, because I, I do believe that it's um, only recently becoming, uh, only recently has one of these platform teams adopted product, proper product owners that has more of this, or it's not only the tech side that's cool, but we need to be sort of, we need, we need to be data driven on on how we actually continue to develop our uh, platform. And sort of we have taken all of the low hanging fruits, then we need to really dig into what are the, uh, the pain points and how are our features and uh, services being uh, adopted by the teams. So again, here we see the, the largest areas and, uh, for improvement when it comes to sort of platform maturity in the Norwegian public sector. So again, this, the, the survey results here, it, it sort of resonates well with my own experience, not only in my part of the organization, but when talking with other uh, agencies across Norway. And then we did some interviews as well. Um, this is a part of uh, a podcast I'm doing together with one of my colleagues. This is Odin Stan from, from the picture in, back in uh, Cube Combalin. Uh, he's still with us, <laughs> and we are doing this podcast here. And the first season was all about public sector in Norway. So we interviewed the Norwegian Police Mapping Authority, Oslo Municipality, the Norwegian Housing Bank, Broadcasting Corporation, digital, Digitalization, Tax Administration, and also we interviewed ourselves. <laughs> that was quite funny. Um, and, and by this point, I would really like sort of all of the Norwegians, uh, Norwegian public sector at least, raise your hand if you're in the room. Yeah, we have quite, so look here, and if you want to talk with someone from the Norwegian public sector other than me, uh, you can find a lot of people here. I know there are a lot of, lot of Norwegian public sector here. So I'm just going to briefly, we talked, about, talked with the um, Norwegian police. They have a platform there called Organa, and sort of a fun fact about them that everything is Star Wars themed. It's really, really cool. They are so nerdy. So, and they, they really love Star Wars. <laughs> so that's, if you like Star Wars, go and find, there are two of them here, without sort of <laughs> saying too much. Um, it started back in 2018. Uh, by now they have roughly 200 product teams and 400 applications running on their Kubernetes-based platform. And they are going, they went with the Kubernetes the hard way, running it uh, themselves, and they are still running it that way and uh, in, in very good shape. Um, we also did a really, really cool interview with the Mapping Authority. Um, they also have a really, really cool platform and, and a solid brand and sort of not only sort of have, do they have a brand, they are actually sort of really proud about it and it's pub all completely public uh, at sheep.kartverket.no uh, and they have a tech blog. I believe it's uh, written in English so it should be sort of very, very um, uh, sort of interesting to everyone in the audience, not only the ones uh, talking in Norwegian. They started a little bit later, but and, ha and have 30 plat uh, product teams and roughly 100 applications, a little less than 100 applications running on the platform. So, and they have some really, really cool challenges when it comes to really, really large amount of data. So it would be interesting to, to see um, how they are going uh, about in the future there. And, uh, really a, a fun fact about them, uh, it's GitOps all the way. So if you want to talk about talk with them 
about real life GitOps, find uh, one. And I know their product owner is <laughs> sitting on the front row, so uh, <laughs> definitely someone that you should talk, talk with. So before we round up, how did it go with Nav after KubeCon? So that was one of the, um, the, the, was a, the welfare administration and it was the tax administration. Well, let's see, this is the deployment frequency. Uh, the weekly deploys to production. Uh, so you can see up until uh, 2017. And then from there, it's sort of more or less skyrocketing up there and hitting an all time high the, these weeks here in uh, the beginning of uh, 2024. And it sort of, it looks like it will continue to just, the, the pace there has been enormously. We have about a little bit less than 2,000 applications running on our. Um, uh, clusters and uh, roughly 200 product teams. Um, we have uh, embraced, as I mentioned, sort of we embraced open source. So not only are we using a lot of open source, we have also open sourced many of our components, or actually all of the components that goes into our platform. They are up on our GitHub organization. Um, and some of these are starting to be used across the public sector. So we now see that we can, instead of having to reinvent the wheel, we can actually get sort of people reusing and then collaborating and contributing. And since we didn't get any time to talk about uh, NAV, I would uh, recommend you to go to the Kubernetes uh, podcast. A huge show, uh, shout out to Abdal and Kaslin. Uh, the the, um, the host there, they did a whole episode about NAV and the nice platform that we have built over the years. So be sure to, to check that out. Then wrapping it up. So what we have seen uh, and what our survey, what my gut instincts and talking with organizations and the service as well, speed matters, agility matters. This is the most important to the public agencies at this point. And I would definitely debunk the myth that, at least in Norway, the, uh, the public sector is not boring. It's co the complete opposite. And I challenge everyone to survey your own public uh, sector. I would really like to be proven wrong that we are not the best public sector out there. <laughs> but we are very privacy concerned. So we have adopted a lot of cloud native, but we still have some really, really rigorous concerns when it comes to data sovereignty and sort of all of the data that we govern. It's not optional to use the public services. Mo many, or of, if not all of them, are um, in many regards mandatory. So we have to be really, really conscious when it comes to our users' data. We cannot just use your SaaS application without going through the due diligence. And mo in most cases, we would really like to have it running on our own Kubernetes clusters. And I would really like to see more public sector in these types of conferences. I did a search, and there were no other mention of the government or public sector in the agenda. So uh, sort of an, uh, sh uh, <laughs> a shout out to everyone in the audience. If you're working with public sector, you should really submit to uh, one of the CFPs. And also the, the, org the committees that uh, sort of selects should also make sure that this is more inclusive and we get more voices about the public sector in these types of events. And with that, we are one minute out <laughs> from our time. Um, like and subscribe, I guess. <laughs> There's a review on the right. And then if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'll be happy to talk with you during the conferences. If we have time for questions, I believe there is a microphone over there and over there. So shoot. Hello. Oh, the microphone works. Hi. Um, really, really cool talk. And fantastic to see public sector stuff doing really well. Uh, as someone who lives in Sweden but came from the UK, our public sector in the UK was dog shit. So I'm happy to live in the Nordics. Um, sorry for the people who are in the UK uh, who are in this room. Um, you mentioned that on the metrics that a bunch of people are using Kubernetes and the clouds, but some are not using Kubernetes and not using the cloud. Uh, as someone who uses the Kubernetes and cloud, what are the other people doing? 
<laughs> yeah, uh, so we see that that is uh, quite, it's uh, divided between running it yourself, Kubernetes the hard way, influenced by Kelsey Hightower, um, running uh, uh, Red Hat OpenShift. A lot of these organizations have a huge Red Hat presence in the past and have adopted OpenShift. And then also all of them, I believe, uh, all of them are running VMware or Broadcom as they are called now. Uh, so Tansu is also in the mix, so these three. But uh, surprisingly, a lot of them are actually running Kubernetes the hard way. Sweet, thank you. Hi. Could I ask you about how do these companies uh, or how do your government agents decide between build versus buy? Because I understand it's a lot more fun. You're getting the EKI effect if you're building your own platform. But maybe by the time you're done, you haven't really anything to show your manager. So where do you stand on a buy versus build decision? Well, we have probably overcorrected uh, some amount because sort of this was in order to get us out of the a little bit swamp that we were already, sort of when everything were only bought. <laughs> uh, so there's probably an overcorrection, but uh, when it comes to purchasing, it sort of needs to adhere at least to the, to the open standards, that there should be a standard here. Uh, I, I don't want to be locked into that vendor and have no recourse in order to do very, very costly migrations when it comes. So we see that um, more and more are adopting cloud and are running their Kubernetes cluster on the cloud. And that's, again, because Kubernetes did something really, really brilliant. And that was sort of, this is a certified Kubernetes uh, sort of version, it adheres to the standard. It's fully compliant with all of the Kubernetes APIs, at least the, the ones that are stable and sort of official. And then I can then in more degrees swap that out uh, to another. It, I know it's not that simple, but again, it sort of makes that equal playing ground there. Uh, so people that place into that this um, sphere here, we are, I'm personally currently uh, sort of uh, implementing open telemetry because uh, again be, not because I want to use this tool or that tool because I want to have the standard and be able to to swap out these tools here when a better one arrives uh, hi can you hear yes um, great talk by the way um, I'm coming from Latin America so uh, but the public sector is like the, my, my, my friend's dog shit as well. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about the, um, like the main projects. As you saw in the survey, you just had like a percentage about uh, what it was Java, which it was Python. But I feel like it, it, it doesn't show like how you, uh, the, the enterprises of the public sector, uh, which is the primary languages that you make actually for the biggest project. So do you mean the applications? Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the, the chart is a little bit misleading because I actually had uh, Java and Kotlin as two separate sort of selections, yeah. and it's Java, it's, or Java-based at least. So that's the, the, there's huge, huge code bases written in Java in the Norwegian public sector. So and, that's yeah. the, the, the first question I was yeah. about that. The second question is that Java actually has a kind of a troubles uh, sometimes, uh, especially with the, the Kubernetes cluster. Hmm. How do you actually manage uh, to make the adoption of Java to the Kubernetes? What was the challenge that you had? Well, it's Java being Java, using a lot of memory and lots of lots of CPU starting up. So you just need you need a lot of resources. It's not Kubernetes here in that regard. It's not sort of to that much optimize it. If if it's sort of very about cost optimization, I would say use something else, <laughs> use Go or something. But more seriously, sort of um, removing the CPU limit has uh, sort of made some uh, challenges less. Uh, challenging when it comes to Java. Um, there's also sort of you can you can adjust the resources. Then uh, that this is very 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 new, and we are looking into it, where you can actually sort of increase the, the re number of resources that the application gets during startup, and then throttle it back down or or reduce the request so you don't over provision when the application is starting up. But what I at least for my organization, what we told is that. You cannot drag your old Java monolith into the system. You need to rewrite it. You need to use a little bit more modern, maybe Spring, maybe Quarkus, maybe something else. Um, and you need to be conscious about your startup time. You cannot start all the services under the sun just because you did that before. Uh, you need to know, you need to sort of reserve what, how much are you actually uh, 
consuming during startup. And maybe you need to lazy load more um, or not or put out those services into a different microservice. But that was sort of the gist there that you need to you need to condense, you need to make your application smaller and it needs to be far faster to start up. All right. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. I have a second question. <laughs> um, it was really interesting to see that you were using a bunch of different platforms for the different organizations. And I wondered, given the prominence of Kubernetes in cloud, and as we're seeing with a lot of like larger projects where they've got like loads of clusters and, and they're doing like fleet management and stuff, and working in my own organization where we starting to look into fleet management and managing things, is do you foresee a move towards like unifying certain platforms and, and reducing the number of platforms that you have? Or is the diversity in the platforms a strength that you think is there? Or? The diversity within one organization or across different organizations? Across all public organizations. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, so what I didn't really say that is my organization, so the, the nice platform that we have built, we are actually in the process of providing that as a service, more or less, to other public agencies. Because we know that it's a huge step to build your own, and it's very costly to buy it uh, also. And we, have already, we, we already have this platform, so either you can take the different components, or we can host it all together. It doesn't really make much difference. If we're already running so many teams, having a few extra doesn't really make any uh, more operational burden from our sense. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Hey, uh, my question is going to be very quick. Where is your product manager? I would love to meet. <laughs> yeah, so the product yeah. manager for Kotbacke yeah, is sitting with a red sweater on the first row. Thank so, you. Uh, definitely go talk with her. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I, I came to your talk because. I like Norway, <laughs> but, but I also work for, I'm not in the public sector, but I work for an organization that's extremely interested in data security and governance. Um, my question to you is, how do you deal with the compliance? How did you build, com like, is there a step for a manual step or something, or do you put like guardrails? How do you deal with the compliance of your application? So uh, I cannot talk for the entire uh, public sector, but for my organization, we are dealing it with primarily that the, the, the building blocks that we are providing through the platform, they are, uh, so to a certain extent, pre-complied. Uh, so we have set up uh, sort of it's, it's a golden path for those building blocks, meaning that if you, if you use that, those, they are already compliant to, to for certain workloads and operations. Can and you that, enforce that? Hmm? You enforce that through the golden path, or, or is it? Well, we make at least we make it really, really difficult to sort of uh, circumvent that. So you, it needs to be a deli very deliberate act. And the, but the second part that's equally important is that we are drilling and drilling and drilling the the application teams that you are responsible for your product. You are responsible for the uh, ultimately. You are responsible for, for the security, for the governance when it's running, etc. So we do have a lot of enabling capabilities. Instead of them sort of making two mile long uh, list of this is everything that you need to, to <laughs> adhere to, they make good guides, recommendations, and they, but they also collaborate with the team. So we have a compliance team. Uh, they have a really good tool where you can do some self-compliance checklist and making sure that you are understanding the regulations that applies to your product. So they are becoming more and more, I'm not saying that we are done, but more and more drilled that this is, this is a concern of the application team and they need to be cognizant of what laws and regulations are applying to their, their product. Because being a large organization, we don't have sort of one size fits all because there's such a variety about really, really important and, and really sensitive health data. And uh, I believe the most uh, sensitive data we have is that people living in hidden, on hidden location because there are someone there trying to harm them. And it's so, if those names get out, uh, even outside of uh, very, very, very few people that are privileged to see them, they need to change the name, they need to change the address, and need to sort of build up their lives. So, and these teams, they really know it. Um, at least that's my understanding talking with them, is they are really, really um, cognizant of the data that they 
uh, sort of govern within their application. And then we have other teams that ha does not have that and are dealing with mostly open information. Anyhow, it's like the, uh, the job marketplace. And of course, that's public, that the job marketplace is completely open. Uh, of course, there are some parts that should not be open and that they are cognizant of that, but that are totally different modes of operations and they need different sort of level of um, compliance in both of them. And the one, of course, gets more help than the other to be able to, to make sure that they are up for the challenge there. And then we are also doing sort of internal reviews, similar to how the tax um, authority will do review of certain groups and certain people. Uh, we do the same internally, making sure that sort of, oh, no, we are checking that is this up to par with a, a certain number of, of uh, representative uh, teams and applications. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, I think we are, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, <laughs>